these are the most profitable corporations that the world has ever seen in the history of the world. These are the biggest, most profitable businesses. And there's a very easy way to invest in all of them that you can do basically for free in 30 seconds. You just buy an index fund that owns them all. So that's a big part of my portfolio. You know, whether it's stocks or bonds, I use index funds because they're they've been shown repeatedly to be the best way to invest in those assets where there's a market adequate enough that you can have an index. Welcome to another podcast. Today, we have a truly inspiring guest, Dr. Jim Dolly, an emergency physician who's not just saving lives in the ER, but is also committed to saving the financial lives of those in the medical field through his groundbreaking platform, The White Coat Investor. Join as we unravel how Jim leverages The White Coat Investor to help medical professionals achieve their finance goals. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Happy to have you. And we'll just start with the basics. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey through medicine and how you started The White Coat Investor. Sure. Just uh, very briefly, for those who haven't heard, I'm an emergency doc. Uh, when I went to college and med school, I had zero interest in business or finance or investing or anything like that. I was a molecular biology major and I wanted to do medicine. And uh, so I went to medical school, decided to go into emergency medicine. And about the time I was halfway through residency, I realized that all the interactions I was having with the financial world were not going well for me that I was being ripped off by insurance agents and financial advisors and realtors and lenders and you name it. And I decided I needed to become financially literate. So I started reading books, interacting on you know the internet, uh, blogs, forums, et cetera, becoming financially literate and continue to do that over the years when I became an attending. And after a few years of that, I realized I was doing a lot more teaching than I was learning. And nobody else was teaching this to doctors. And so I decided to, uh, to start a website called the white coat investor it was a blog you know just typing random things into the internet trying to educate doctors and and it took off and has since become the most widely read physician specific personal finance and investing website in the world and of course we've expanded from there into podcasts and you know video and online courses and we have an annual live conference and um, you name it you know we try to put this information into whatever format docs prefer to learn it in well that's amazing how, how many followers do you have well, it depends on the platform, right? I mean, our Facebook groups, 100,000, our, you know, our forums, less than that. Our subreddits, probably one of the fastest growing things. There's about 50,000 people there. You know, probably two or 300,000 people come by the website every month. That's wonderful. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I had a similar uh, story as I was practicing medicine. I also felt that I didn't know enough about investing in finances, but my father invested in real estate and, and he was the one that actually taught me how to invest in real estate. So as I progressed through my career, I started investing a little bit here and there. I actually invested in these, these uh, small multifamily units, lived in one, rented the other two, and uh, kind of grew that way and grew to the point where I was basically getting paid to educate myself, which is the best way to do it, obviously, right? You're, you know, you're learning, you're, you're earning money, and you're, and you're educating yourself so you can continue to grow. So that's what really we would like to have happen for our listeners, and I'm sure you would like to have happen for, to your community, is that you're investing, you're earning money, and you're learning all at the same time. So uh, in that light, you know, as you mentioned, White Coast Coat Investor has grown significantly. So how has your mission evolved over the years, and what impact do you see it having on the medical community? You know, the fun part about the mission is we're still very dedicated to it. You know, we've rephrased it over the years, you know, whether we call it getting a fair shake on Wall Street or whether we call it not doing dumb stuff with your money. Um, you know, the mission's the same. And I still feel very much a missionary zeal toward getting this information out there, inspiring docs to develop some financial discipline and some financial literacy, because the combination of those two things in our world today, they're so rare. It's like having a superpower. Do you know how money works and you have the ability to actually, you know, discipline yourself and put it to work? You can do some pretty amazing things when you combine all that with a physician income. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's very true. And, you know, to your point in the beginning, you you don't really have full trust in in financial people. Like I, I felt that as I was going through my journey, I just felt that they were coming from a different perspective and they had different incentives. And, you know, obviously the more they transacted, the more money they would make. And and I, I was feeling that, but I, I think, you know, both of us being physicians, there's, there's another, there's a trust factor because we're not trying to make those same types of returns. We don't come from the same place. You know, we come from a place where we, you know, we, we got into our careers because we, we actually care about people. 
We want to improve the lives of people. And, and that's how we frame our our investment strategy, you know, Viking Capital and and the White Coat Investor. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it's not the same people that become kindergarten teachers and go into insurance sales. They're not the same people. Yeah, right, right. And we get so used to it in medicine that all the other professionals we're interacting with all day long all stood up at a certain point and, and swore a Hippocratic oath that they would do the right thing for the patient, aka the client, no matter what, whether that was bad for their pocketbook or not. And uh, sometimes we think all other professions work that way, and they just don't. They just yeah. don't. And uh, and so, you know, Dr. Bernstein, William Bernstein's a neurologist, wrote a bunch of financial books and had a blog for a while. And, you know, he said, basically, you should interact with the financial services industry like they're all hardened criminals. You know, that's the mindset you need to be in when you interact with them, because you need to put your business hat on, right? You can't yeah. be there with your medicine hat. And expect things to end well for you. You need to, you know, have your have your sensors up, have your eyes open, and, and recognize that uh, if you let them, they'll rip you off. Basically, yeah, you know, it's it's good to have this healthy doubt, right? You know, I, I was I was at a conference recently. It's called NMHC, the National Multifamily Housing Conference. It takes place every year in San Diego, and we have a there was a particular asset that was that was bothering me. I mean, I lost sleep uh, thinking about how it would perform and how we could refinance it and restructure the debt. Luckily, we were able to do so and do it do it in a really nice way. But I was talking to a couple colleagues about this. I was like, uh, you know, this was really bothering me and and, and I we, we finally figured it out and I could, you know, sleep better at night now. And some of them were surprised uh, at that. They're like, "Hey, look, you know, you're the first person that actually I spoke with that that kind of felt this way, which surprised me. I'm like, really? You know, that's not saying that there, are, there aren't other people that care about their investors, but like, I think the majority of of these finance people, it's just sort of like they 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 don't think about that aspect as much. It's you know, in their mind, their focus is um, you know on other things, maybe on growing their business and not necessarily each individual investor. Whereas you know, for for me, and I feel like you know, I'm sure for you. And people in our community, it's 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 sort it's sort of a different mindset. Yeah. Well, the, the amazing thing about business now, you know, and I've haven't been employed since 2010. You know, I've only been self-employed. I've been in business, whether it was medicine or whether it's a white coat investor, for the last decade and a half. But the interesting thing I've learned about business is the more you take care of your people, your clients, your customers, your patients, whatever, the better you take care of them, the better your business does. You know, if you put them first, it's not like you have to choose between treating them well and having your business be successful. You can do both. And in fact, you're more likely to do both if you take an approach in the long term that I'm just going to do the right thing for these people. And uh, sometimes it costs you a little money in the short term, but it doesn't cost you anything in the long term because in the long term, they appreciate that. They value that. They're more likely to, to stick with you. They're more likely to refer their friends. It, it's just a much better approach to business. And who wants to be in business with someone that doesn't treat you that way? So I think that's a, that's a real key to business. A lot of people think that the terrible people make all this money by ripping people off. But in my experience, the best business people I've met are not terrible people. They're trying to treat everybody as best as they possibly can. And that's what makes them successful. It attracts other like-minded, successful people to them. And so I think that's that's a great mindset to have anytime you go into business where you're serving others. Absolutely. Wonderful. So, so uh, you know, obviously your platform offers a wealth of resources. So for someone interested in leveraging the White Coat Investor to grow their investments, where should they start? I mean, I, I think you have to ask yourself how you learn, right? If I look at myself and how I learned, how I became financially literate, it was mostly reading books and interacting with others, asking and answering questions on forums. You know, and if somebody's like that, we have that resource. You know, I've published four books and we have four different platforms where people can interact with others. We have one that's just for women, the financially empowered women. We have a subreddit. We have a forum hosted right on the White Coat Investor site. And we have a, a big old Facebook group. So however people like to interact with each other, that works fine. But I found other people are like podcast people. You know, they just listen to podcasts all the time when they're running, when they're walking the dog, when they're going to work. So we've got a podcast. We actually have two podcasts, you know, one one that's the Milestones podcast where we celebrate people's successes and one that we basically answer their questions and, uh, and interview interesting people on the podcast. So however they like to learn, I think, is the way to to interact with the White Coat Investor. All that, of course, is found at whitecoatinvestor.com. It's the hub for everything. But you got to realize that we're, we're trying to help you learn the way you learn best, whether that's an online course or whether that's periodic emails in your email box. Now, are these resources free? Yeah, probably 98% of the content we produce is totally free. 
obviously if you buy my book, I'm going to get paid. You know, Amazon yeah. typically sells them for 18 or 20 or 25 bucks. If you come to our conference, we charge for that. You know, that's one of our premium products. So if, if the way you want to learn is to come to a live conference and use your CME dollars to do it, you're going to pay for that. And then of course we charge for our online courses, but everything else, the blog, the podcast, the email newsletters, the communities, all totally free. But it's free to the user. About half of our online courses are CME accredited. And uh, our conference is, is uh, this year it was good for 16, you know, AMA category one hours of uh, CME. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. So I'm going to start getting into some maybe pearls that people can take away from this conversation. Let's start with just investment allocation. You got, there's so much in this world of investment. So, so how do you allocate your investments, you know, securities, real estate, bonds, savings, et cetera? You know, this is a fascinating discussion because your audience is very different from the average physician. I just came back from speaking to a group of young doctors in Austin, right? Most of whom don't know the difference between a Roth IRA and a credit card, quite honestly, right? Just very, very low level of financial literacy. And uh, one of the easiest ways to invest is to simply buy all the stocks in the world via a very low cost, broadly diversified index fund or two. And so a lot of times when I'm talking to docs who are completely financially illiterate, I focus a lot on that investment because it's so easy, so reliable, and people forget what stocks are, right? These are the most profitable corporations that the world has ever seen in the history of the world. These are the biggest, most profitable businesses. And there's a very easy way to invest in all of them that you can do basically for free in 30 seconds. You just buy an index fund that owns them all. So that's a big part of my portfolio. You know, whether it's stocks or bonds, I use index funds because they're they've been shown repeatedly to be the best way to invest in those assets where there's a market adequate enough that you can have an index fund. However, there's also a portion of my portfolio that's in private investments. It's basically real estate, right? So I have 60% of my portfolio in stocks, 20% in bonds, 20% in real estate. On the real estate side, about a quarter of it is in publicly traded real estate, REITs essentially. A quarter of it is in debt real estate, primarily in funds that make loans to developers. And, uh, and half of it is in equity real estate, primarily via funds. I've still got a few syndications left over that I've purchased that haven't gone full course yet, but primarily in funds. And, uh, and that's my asset allocation. But people ask me all the time, well, what's an appropriate allocation to real estate? Yeah. And I tell them zero to 80%. It's okay not to have any at all. That's fine. You can become financially independent without ever investing in real estate. But I don't think anybody should put it all into real estate. It's just too easy to take advantage of investing in the most profitable companies the world has ever seen that I think it's worthwhile. Even if you are a total real estate guru, you love real estate, you you eat, drink, and sleep real estate, I think you probably ought to still stick 20% of your money into stocks. Yeah, uh, that's good advice. Um, and given this is a real estate podcast, let's break down uh, the real estate investments a bit more. So you mentioned you invest... 25% in REITs and 25% in debt. Is that correct? That's right. So it actually works out to be 5% of the portfolio. Sure. Is. So can you describe to the audience why why that ratio? And and, and then you also mentioned half in equity investments. Like wh what the de definition is of those types of investments, why you broke it down that way. Sure. Uh, when I think about REITs, I think about these publicly traded companies, right? Slightly different tax structure than a, than a typical corporation that you see on the stock market. It's not a C corp, it's a REIT, but they're publicly traded. You can buy and sell them every day. Every day the market's open, you can get in and out. They're completely liquid. And like anything that's traded on you know a stock exchange like that, the best way to invest in them is simply buy them all, right? Because it's just too hard to figure out which are the good ones, which are the bad ones. And there are so many analysts looking at these companies that the right way to act is to assume that they're efficiently priced. And so I just go to Vanguard, I buy their real estate index fund. And, uh, you know, the ETF equivalent of that is VNQ. I think it charges five or six basis points as an expense ratio. And you get to own all 120 equity REITs traded on the public markets. Um, there's a lot of data out there comparing public real estate with private real estate. Some studies show one has better returns. Some studies show the other does. Most of the studies show that public real estate has slightly higher returns but that when added to a portfolio, private real estate actually benefits the portfolio more because its correlation with stocks is lower. And so there's good reasons to hold both of those. And so that's why I have some of my money in publicly traded real estate. On the yes. private side, now this is 15% of my portfolio, right? 
5% in debt and 10% in equity. I like funds on the debt side. This is These are some of my favorite investments. I love them. They're great, right? They're very steady, eddy returns. Basically, you're giving your money to a company and what they do is they loan out something like 70 to 200 or 300 loans to developers. You're basically their bank and they, they come to this fund because the fund can give them their money within a week or two right? Uh, that they understand the underlying investment and they're loaning based on that rather than going to a bank where it takes two or three or four months to get your money. And they have all these hassles and all these rules and all these regulations. And yes, they might be able to get a little bit cheaper, but the cost of it actually doesn't matter if you're only going to be borrowing the money for, for four months or six months or 12 months or whatever. So they'd rather interact with one of these private funds. So they'll come in and they'll pay the fund 12%. And two points in order to borrow that money from the fund and not deal with the bank. Well, the fund takes its cut and it gives the rest to you. So what do you end up with? You end up with something like 7 to 12% returns, very steady, you know, monthly income. These funds tend to be pretty liquid as private investments go. You know, often you can get your money out within one to three months. And, uh, and you just get these great returns, you know, maybe 9% every year, you know, none of these negative years like you get in the stock market, although you're never going to shoot the lights out. You're never going to get 25% returns out of them. And uh, so I think those are pretty cool. The big downside to debt investments, of course, is that they're terribly tax inefficient, right? All of the return is paid out every year and it's all paid at ordinary income tax rates. You can't shelter any of it with depreciation. So that's the big downside to these debt investments. But if you can stick them inside a self-directed 401k or a self-directed IRA, that concern goes away. And, uh, and they're pretty good IRA or 401k investments. So that's, that's the REITs and, and the debt side. Excellent. Well, that's, that's great information. You know, just uh, I'll share a personal story about REITs, you know, we as a, a multifamily syndication company are looking for preferred equity partners. Now you can invest in equity as well. You know, if you look at the capital stack of any type of investment at the, the most senior of that is debt. And as you mentioned, debt funds is a great way to invest because you are, it's the most stable type of uh, investment in, in that capital stack. After debt fund, funds comes prep equity funds, then comes, you know, this kind of the standard retail equity. And you take a risk investing as a normal equity, but then um, you also potentially get the highest gains. And then you can also take depreciation into account as well. So we as a company um, are looking for prep equity, equity partners. And sometimes these REITs are actually function as equity partners in our deals. And you know they have capital to invest. They want to invest in something that's relatively stable, like a equity position. And, and they invest that way because it's, it's just a safer type of investment. Now there's some REITs that um, have excess amount of cash. And sometimes they will invest in assets that aren't maybe a little risky, but they just have to fill their buckets. So it's something you just really want to pay attention to. You want to do your research uh, before you invest. And you know, the, the one you mentioned, the Vanguard, I'm not too familiar with it, but I imagine it's like a, a pretty safe option. You know, safety is in the eye of the beholder, right? Yeah. When you buy it, you're buying 120 different REITs and each of those owns I don't know how many company, how many properties, hundreds of properties each, and they tend to be pretty big properties. So you're diversified between managers and companies and states, and you're all, you know, you're all over the country with it. So it's very diversified that way. But don't kid yourself; it can be pretty volatile. In 2008, that investment from peak to trough lost 78% of its value. Yeah. Now, if you just held on for a year or two, it all came back. But you know, expect some volatility. It's traded on the market, and it gets marked to market each day, and you get to see that volatility if you watch it. And uh, so, you know, if, if that volatility bothers you, there's, there's a lot of risk there. Okay, great. So that's, that's uh, REITs, that's uh, debt funds. And then you mentioned half in equity real estate yeah, private and equity. private I mean, equity. I mean, okay. Most of those REITs are also equity positions in, in their holdings. You know, obviously okay. there's some preferred equity, but that particular Vanguard ETF doesn't invest in, doesn't invest in debt REITs or mortgage REITs. It's only equity REITs. Um, but on the equity side, on the private side, I like funds. I like the diversification of funds. And let me give you an example why. I invest with a fund manager. I invested in a, in a fund. It's a closed end fund. They raised the capital in 2017. And they'll probably finish returning it all at the end of this year. Basically, they went and bought 17 different properties. You know, most of them were multifamily. A few of them were office, right? This is 2017 before everybody knew office sucks, you know? And so it was five or six office investments and the rest were multifamily. Well, uh, now at this point in the in the fund's life, they've sold 14 of the properties for a gain. They still have two in the fund that they're trying to get sold. 
And then they had one, it was an office investment that just was not going well at all. And they mailed in the keys. They gave the property to the bank, exercised their put option and gave it to the bank. 100% loss of capital on that property. And yet the returns on this fund are still double digit. And so that's the awesome thing about being in a fund is that you can have terrible things happen and that diversification protects you from them. Or rather than having to come with $100,000 to invest in one property, you come up with $100,000 and you get 17 properties. So uh, I tend to lean toward funds more often. Uh, I've invested in syndications directly where you really have to evaluate the deal. When you're investing in a fund, it's much more about evaluating the manager. Yes. Uh, even in a syndication, the manager matters far more than the deal because a good operator, a good GP can make a lemonade out of lemons, but a bad one can turn even a, a good deal into a, into a lousy investment. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other thing, you know, again, you, know, you have to use your discretion on all these investments, but what I've seen, I've seen, I've seen a couple of uh, ways that the fund investment plays out. The one you described, that's, that's great. And, and I've obviously have invested in funds like that, but I've also invested in funds where it's a blind end fund, right? So you don't really necessarily, you don't know what you're investing in, but you put that money into the fund, hoping that the manager will invest in assets that make sense. Well, this particular fund had so much money, so much capital that they had to invest. Mm. So they started, That's and this was back in, there. yes, exactly. So they had to find something. Now this was back in 2020. One, uh, I believe, and they they just bid up, bid up the pricing to the point where all the brokers, because we spoke to these brokers, they were just like, "You want to sell to these guys? They will give you top dollar for every asset you have." And in fact, that word on the street was, "Look at them for anything they anything you want to you want to sell. They're the, they're the go to." So you know, people investing in that fund thought they were going to get that diversification. They they felt that you know their their risk was a bit less given the diversification, but the truth was it was, you know, the whole thing was incredibly risky. So you just have to be wary of those types of things. It's very important that you vet, you know, the managers, the the funds, like any type of investment very, you know, uh, thoroughly before you, you put your money into it. And then once you find something that you really like and makes sense for you and that you've proven that works, then just, you know, kind of rinse and repeat. And obviously, Diversify, as you were saying, Jim. You know that's 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 so important, not just across you know real estate classes, but all all classes of investment. Yeah, I think your caution's uh, very appropriate, though. I can tell you a story about another fund I'm invested in, and this was a fund that uh, I think the contribution was supposed to be two hundred fifty thousand, and they were going to have capital calls as they bought assets uh, over the course of a year and a half or something like that. Well, about two years into it, they deployed half the capital. And they basically came back to the investors and said, we can't find anything worth buying. We're not going to call the rest of the capital. And yeah. so I appreciated that they you know, didn't take my money until they had something they thought was worth buying and were more than willing to stop, even though it resulted in them earning less fees. It was a little bit of a bummer because I didn't end up getting invested as much as I wanted to get invested. I kind of wish I'd told them I was going to invest twice as much. But uh, you know, a good manager will do that. They'll, they see themselves as a steward of your assets rather than just an asset gatherer. Yeah, um, but you're right. There are plenty of funds out there that just want to get their hands on your money and get it invested in some way. And diversifying when all of the assets are crappy doesn't help you much. Yes, absolutely. Let's, Jim. Can you share some success stories of how people have leveraged the white coat investor and made an impact on their investment strategy? Sure. Uh, I think it's important to point out though that a lot of the big gains for docs and other high income professionals in their financial lives are not necessarily on the investing side, right? There's a lot of other things to our financial lives that are important to take care of. For example, there are all kinds of people out there that, that spend all kinds of time on their investments every month and they haven't bothered buying the insurance they need to own, right? They're not financially independent. They're working for a living. They don't own disability and life insurance, right? Or they haven't done any estate planning whatsoever and they get smacked by a bus, right? And now their heirs are in a mess trying to sort everything out. And so it's important to, to do your financial planning as well, right? It doesn't matter what you invest in when you're only putting 2% of your income into it every year. Right until you got your budget and your savings, all that set up appropriately, it really doesn't matter if you're investing in stocks or syndications or debt funds or anything else. You, you got to put some money into the investments if you want to have money. That's the most important thing when it comes to investing. Um, so let me share a, a couple of testimonials that uh, that I've had over the years. You know, here's one uh, from somebody who said, "As I complete my training next month and move into attending hood, 
I just wanted to take the time to thank you and tell you how important your website and your book have been to my family and me. Two years ago, I knew nothing about personal finance, investing, or taxes. My wife and I were expecting a child, and we had loans piling up and no emergency fund, life insurance, and no financial plan. Now I can honestly say I've read eight books on finance and investing. I'm a daily reader of your website, and I'm jokingly known as the financial investing guru to the local fellows and residents when they have questions. I've been recommending your book to every resident, fellow, attending, and rotating medical student I've met from Houston to Atlanta as it has impacted my life so much. And I probably get two or three emails like that a day from people out there. That's awesome. Changing lives, just teaching finance, just teaching the basics. And that's probably the biggest difference we make. Uh, But on the investing side, it's clearly working. You know, we had a... uh... We had a survey of our audience that we did recently and published the results of that. And, uh, and we just asked people, you know, what's your, what's your net worth? You know, how much do you have? And, uh, and I was pleased to see that it's very different from the general surveys of net worth that you do among doctors, right? When you uh, ask doctors about their net worth, you'll find out that, uh, that most of them aren't even millionaires. Even docs in their 60s, about 25% of them, are still not millionaires. Uh, but I was pleased to see that about a third of our, or about two thirds of our audience are millionaires. Uh, a third of them are already multimillionaires. 4% of them are decamillionaires. And uh, so it's clearly working to, to put these principles in place and, and start building wealth. That's wonderful. And uh, for those of you who haven't looked at your website, I'm, I'm pulling it up now. I see that there's, you know, there's disability insurance, there's student loan refinancing, mortgage loans, finance resources, student loan advice various courses. So it looks like there's a, a full gamut of, of material on here. So this is excellent. So Jim, anything else before we end, anything else you'd like to share with our audience? Any bits of advice? I think uh, probably the most important thing is for people to recognize they're not alone in this, that there is a whole community out there of people that are willing to take you by the hand, to walk with you in your journey, no matter where you are. You know, you you listen to a podcast like this and you hear all these terms, you're not even sure what all of them quite mean. And, uh, and you, you, you should recognize that we've all been in your position, that we have been, you know, essentially financially literate or semi-literate and that this stuff can be learned. It's way easier than learning medicine in a lot of ways. And, uh, and you can do this. So don't be afraid of it. Get started. Take the first step carve some money out of your income and start investing it. And you'll be amazed what happens by making all these little steps as you go along five or 10 years from now, you're going to have so much flexibility, so many choices in your life that allow you to reduce your burnout and focus on your patients and your family and your own wellness and the things that really matter to you in your life. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great take home message. And that ultimately that's what we want, right? You know, we certainly are looking for financial freedom, but along with that comes time freedom. It comes, um, you know, the freedom to give to charities. It becomes the freedom of, of health or geography or whatever you're, whatever freedoms you're looking for. Very often it starts with financial freedom. So that's just so important. It's such an important concept to grasp. And once you have that, you know, you can, you can really live a life of passion um, rather than living a life because you have to, you know, earn a paycheck to paycheck. Having your yeah. ducks in a row doesn't guarantee happiness, but uh, not having them in a row can almost certainly guarantee misery. Yes, that is true. Well, wonderful, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, if somebody wants to contact you, you know, discuss more about this with you, how can they do so? They can email me, editor at whitecoatinvestor.com. I don't think I've ever gotten an email, you know, personal email I haven't responded to. Uh, but chances are good. Whatever question you've got has been answered somewhere at the whitecoatinvestor.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much. If you like this podcast, please hit subscribe or a thumbs up and we'll see you next time.